Hi guys, sorry to join late. Not at all. I think we're I think we're just about all in all in now, so we'll get started. Um, so yeah, for those who are joining us for the first time, welcome, and those who are coming back, um, good to see you all again. Um, so today we're delighted to have Robbie Morrison of um, Open Energy System Modeling Community. Uh, by way of brief introduction, uh, Robbie is a Kiwi from New Zealand who started energy system modeling in 1995. Prior to that, he worked for the Sustainable Energy Forum, a small NGO advocating for energy systems that avoid the transfer of cost to future generations. Previously, Robbie lived in Brixton, London for three years when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister and Britain was also in quite some political turmoil. Robbie moved to Berlin in 2000 to study energy systems. He added a GPL V2 Plus license to the DECO code base in 2003 and tried unsuccessfully to build an online community of users and developers. Robbie became active in the Open Energy Modeling Initiative 18 months after it had formed in 2014. He continues to advocate for sustainable energy systems and for transport and open analysis to underpin the necessary public involvement, public policy development, and ultimately public acceptance. Um, so just quickly before letting Robbie go, we, we are recording this meeting. So if anyone has any um, bits they want to cut out or anything, do just drop, drop us a line. Um, Robbie will talk for sort of perhaps 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. But if you have anything sort of burning, do raise, do raise your hand and we can, we can address that as we're going along. So without further ado, Robbie. Hi. Yes, this is a story. This is, this is a story where the plot line in which uh, Germany plays uh, a key part in the plot line, but also United States research is uh, part of the story from the outset. And more latterly, more latterly from um, NREL, the um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. But it's a plot line in which the UK has been conspicuously absent until now, and, and perhaps we might cover some, some reasons, I don't know. Um, so I think the summary at the beginning pretty much covered um, my background. More recently, I've been involved with the Icebreaker One Open Energy Project via their Phase Two Advisory Group to um, covering policy, legal, and regulatory. And that's a fascinating project, but it mostly involves encumbered data, either personally um, encumbered for privacy reasons or commercially encumbered. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I'm only going to talk about non-personal open data through this, through this um, presentation. Um, I participate in the Linux Foundation Energy Data Architecture Special Interest Group. Um, I'm the steering committee of the Open Energy Ontology, and I contributed recently to an era data process on energy sector metadata. Um, so that's some background. I'm not going to talk about energy system modeling. I've put some slides in here so that people reading the PDF will have some more context. There's clearly been a revolution in open source software and in more lately in non-personal open data. And I watched all that in actual fact um, through my involvement with energy system modeling. Interestingly, that some of the earlier excuses that I put to people, or that I, I put the idea that people should open source their projects, like all the usual excuses, the code is too messy, there is no documentation, we have no overhead for servicing inquiries and so forth. Some of those people are the strongest advocates in the open energy modeling initiative. Um, so it's just interesting how, how things change. There is a data tsunami. And I'm going to argue that it's driven equally by transparency, but also by opportunity. And I would just like to mention that data ownership does not really exist in this, in this um, context. Uh, so people should, if they're looking for opportunity, develop an opportunity, and I'm thinking of um, government agencies and so forth, um, they need to embrace the fact that this uh, data is not owned and there is no um, proprietary context for it. Uh, one thing that uh, is happening at the moment too, in parallel, is the open science movement. And our corner of the world involves um, computational science. So it's the gray block 
and that won't come to any surprise to most people on this webinar, I suspect. I, I want to talk just briefly about development archetypes because I've watched these as well. Um, we have the single institution closed model, either run by a government agency or a research institute. Um, we have a few examples, uh, very few examples of our freeware products, which are in which the ex Windows executable is distributed at no cost. We have a long history of consortium development, and of course, the most well known would be the Markle Times consortium. Um, but this is an, an excludable uh, arrangement, and often um, with membership fees, in the, in the case of Markle Times, very, very significant membership fees. And more recently, we've had the open source projects coming through. The de degree to which community is involved in this is important. And um, clearly, the, the notion of community is, is not restricted to open source projects. Um, but our, our goal, and I say our, is the open energy modeling community, is, is to get open licenses onto code bases, onto data sets, and start building communities which are inclusive and non-excludable. The Open Energy Modeling Initiative began in Berlin in September 2014. I was not there. I joined 18 months later when I heard about it through an obscure publication. Two-day meeting. It was in German. There were 28 attendees. They produced a manifesto. Um, all good social movements need a manifesto, of course. And uh, I just want to underscore that open source lawyer Till Jaeger spoke at the first meeting. Till is, um, as you see from the reference below, is, is, um, has written the, 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 the main reference on um, open source software law in the German context. So here's the manifesto. Um, the URL down the bottom will take you to it. The usual issues, community, quality, efficiency, um, improved insights um, and information and knowledge sharing were, were, were key issues. Um, I'll just highlight that metadata standards were there from the very beginning and so was model interoperability. So why Germany? Um, why, why did the open mod begin in Berlin? And this is a question I've, I've thought about a little and I've asked my um, expat um, friends and my German friends. And uh, these, are, these are five reasons. Firstly, the German federal government does not run any in-house models. The ministry's commission analysis um, is a wish from research institutes and so forth um, in order to get the analysis that they need. Uh, the individual mi ministries set the terms of reference based on their needs and preferences um, so that some of the discussion about um, robustness and, um, and, and so forth um, are, are difficult to traverse in this, um, in this context. Um, and the policy analysts in, the, uh, in Germany are extremely astute and streetwise. The next reason is the universities are structured around professors and not departments. And then you ran into the problem that most of the models that had been written to up to a certain point um, were written as um, single PhD projects and they didn't easily uh, coalesce or, or scale up. Increasing frustration with duplicated work or doppelarbeit, of course, we know this. Um, substantial funding for energy system research, also key. The uh, German energy vendor began in, say, the year 2000 with the Atom consensus, um, and research funding followed. And lastly, there are some cultural roots for open source development. The Chaos Computer Club, LibreOffice is based here, Wikipedia, Germany is strong, um, and so on. I'm not sure, and I will happily be corrected that um, so much of that has actually taken place in the context of the United Kingdom. The open mod has an ethos. Um, the working language is now English. Um, it provides forums, 
but it does not endorse individual projects and nor does it advocate policy positions aside, I guess, from the very general um, concept of, of open. Uh, events and online services are run under the benign dictatorship principle whereby organizers and administrators are provided with complete dominion. And the community runs several online services, a mailing list, a wiki, a forum. Um, I'm the lead admin on the forum now that Tom Brown stepped down at the end of last year. And the bottom URL will give you a full rundown on, on those um, services and who's responsible. The, the question with a, a, a organization like this is how many participants? And I'm going to take the ge geometric middle point between the last physical workshop at around 200 and the mailing list registrations at around 800 and, and settle on 400. Um, uh, as you know, a, a lot of the discussion is about data, but data is actually very difficult to separate from code. And this slide just gives a, an indication of, of, of the, the complexity, if you like, of, of the landscape, um, the code data landscape. On the left-hand side are some technical issues, and on the right-hand side are, are legal issues related to the types of licenses. Um, so the law is clear that data and code are very different. Um, this is under intellectual property rights law. Um, but in reality, um, that, that separation is, is, is somewhat arbitrary. I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue that data is actually social glue. Um, and I've noticed this in the last two years and I'm, I'm, I'm very, thrilled, to be honest, to see this take place. Um, some of those projects that have surfaced have their genesis a little earlier in, in uh, funding applications that were written by some very astute people. But there is now domain-wide cooperation on, on data management, and um, it in, falls into various camps, semantics, technical standards, data portals, and um, also uh, more specific to energy modeling are, are, are the set standard are the scenarios that should be starting to, to become somewhat more standardized. Um, I'll return to some of these points later, so I'll just skip through. I want, I want to introduce a touchstone definition for open data because it's an elastic concept and I've been talking to some a uh, large um, oil major about their use of the term open data, um, and it would be bordering on, on open washing. So in this case, I'm going to use the European Commission Open Data Directive of 2019, Recital 16, where open data as a concept is generally understood to denote data in an open format that can be freely used, reused, and shared by anyone for any purpose. For those paying attention, you'll find that the open source movement has very similar um, definitions for uh, open source as, as, a, as a concept. Um, the database directive, which covers Europe um, and is still on the United Kingdom's statute, is, um, is, is our main problem. Um, the legal definition of a database is very broad and a database is protected. This is a public database. This is people extracting from a, um, a public database. It's protected where the direct investment is substantial and the extraction is substantial. And this idea of um, substantial derives from copyright law, but um, it's a catch-22 because the users cannot determine um, what kind of investment was involved and what kind of size um, the database is um, comprises is comprised of. Um, also, the, the director was designed to create a database industry, but it didn't work. And we find that material in Europe simply gets harvested and used to stock US servers. Um, and it 
creates uh, legal uncertainty for risk adverse researchers in the absence of uh, suitable, suitable open licenses. The US is, is, opposite, is the opposite. They never enacted a database protection law, although there were attempts. And if you read this uh, statement, you'll find that copyright in a compilation to use the US term or a collection to use the German term of uh, data is highly unlikely. So, so non-personal data in the, in the United States is not covered by any intellectual property um, regime. There may be some uh, civil law issues related to things like um, misappropriation and, and so forth, but um, but in terms of intellectual property, um, there is nothing that binds. My personal picks for open data licenses are the Creative Commons CC BY 4.0. It must be 4.0. That was the first one that dealt with the database directive, or the Creative Commons CC 0 1.0. And that's necessary because it works in civil law jurisdictions like Germany. Um, the other jurisdictions such as the US have the idea of public domain, um, but that's not built into, into, into the German um, tradition of, of copyright. Anyway, in most cases, open data licenses give, um, provide permission, they do not provide permission as I've indicated, rather they often offer certainty. Okay, um, so that's a sort of a break in, in, in the webinar, and I'd like to move on to the second part, which is actually talking about some of the uh, domain-wide domain -wide data projects which have emerged, and some have emerged, as I said, relatively recently, although they have some genesis um, earlier. And I want to deal with two that, that look at the high-level concepts. So one is the open energy ontology, and ontology is a shared world view, um, which is necessary for people doing um, computational um, uh, science. And an ontology supports data annotation. It supports interface homogenization for model coupling. And it supports a natural form of querying called ontology-based data access. The other project is the ERA data project, and um, that's looking at metadata in a, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very short sentence. Metadata is data about data, and it enables cataloging. It underpins the fair data principles, um, particularly findability and interoperability, and it can support um, license compliance. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if your metadata includes um, legal attributes. The second slide of three is, the, is an emphasis on infrastructure or tooling. And uh, there are several, several um, um, projects. I, on, on the far left-hand side, I, I put little flags um, to, to, to kind of orientate them a little. Um, so the first one is the Open Energy family, which is uh, based around various research institutes in, in, the, uh, in Germany, and it provides a collaborative framework for data management. Uh, the next one, also based in Germany, is uh, linked open data related to um, uh, Earth observations and uh, particularly important for things like doing renewables assessments. And, um, and this is a team up with the DBpedia data bus project, um, which is essentially a layer that sits between the internet and the user and, and manages the data process. It, it's smart, it knows when, when data changes and alerts the user, it, it keeps, um, it keeps uh, copies where necessary because, as we all know, the web is, has no guarantees on, on um, uh, persistence, for example. And, and so this is really exciting work, I think. The next one is Spine, from, um, based in Finland, uh, which it has a number of dimensions, but the one I've highlighted here is, uh, is, is a 
a method for um, swapping uh, data between different models to do model uh, cross-model comparisons. PIAM is uh, more related to integrated assessment models and the, and the energy systems that are captured within those that typically look out to 2100 rather than 2050. Um, and the final one on the slide is PAR systems um, dot JL dot JL and indicates the Julia language um, and it comes from NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory and it is a um, efficient cross-model data management utility um, quite abstracted which will then serve data to um, individual models in, in, in the form that those models require. Um, it, it also has some internal um, computational um, power so it can check for integrity and, and do some other relatively simple calculations that electrical engineers do. Um, but if you want to um, do full scale um, energy system analysis, you have to couple it with, a, with an energy system model, of course. The third slide on this are uh, uh, the main way data projects with an emphasis on content. The first one is the OPSD project. Um, which uh, originated in, in Germany and uses um, information, a lot of it harvested from the ENSOE transparency platform. That's, that's the platform that's defined in law, um, which requires mandatory reporting from uh, the, the, the various participants in the electricity system in Europe. Um, it's mandatory reporting, statutory reporting, because it is designed to um, en en enhance system security and um, and allow new entrants to to um, to contribute. Um, without that information, they would be less likely to do so. Then I have four US-based um, schemes. Uh, Power system case builder is is the data back backdrop to the to the earlier power systems .jl project I mentioned. Power genome also looking at US um, capacity expansion information, and again with our model transfer. The open energy outlook from North Carolina State University is also building a data background for their work um, to, to make an open energy outlook that is somehow parallel to the, the official energy outlook that comes from the um, Energy Information Agency. And the last one is P PDUL, Puddle, I suppose, um, which is also looking at um, getting utility data and, and processing it and uh, packaging it for, for wider consumption. Uh, so I mentioned briefly the OPSD project. I'll, I'll talk a little bit further about it. Um, it, it, has, uh, it, it. It serves much of Europe. It has power plant fleet information. That, that information is actually quite difficult to assemble. And, and um, uh, there, there is an interesting paper uh, which, which um, which basically merged, took, used um, Python code to merge three power plant fleet inventories um, to get the one that was the least inconsistent. Um, so this is all quite difficult stuff. And, you know, it would, would kind of help if the reporting, the statutory reporting was, was to a higher standard. They have um, time series on production and load and weather data. Launched in October, 2016, um, it has extensive curation and all the processing scripts are on GitHub for, for inspection. It serves open knowledge foundation frictionless data packages, which are CSV files for tabular data and JSON for metadata. And there are still issues with licensing. Um, Although the, the material is harvested from the transparency platform and the transparency platform is set up under statute, 
Um, it's still not clear whether the database protection applies and the um, OPSD have a, a, a kind of informal ag agreement that what they do is okay. We'd like to see this cleaned up. Okay, um, this one wasn't mentioned in the big earlier table because it comes under the open energy family, uh, but it's a scenario database project. And um, I just want to briefly mention that uh, on the right hand side, there is a gray block, uh, which is this uh, platform, the open energy platform, which provides the backdrop and uh, functionality to these other, other um, types of information which are being stored there. Firstly, um, data sets um, with metadata, uh, fact sheets, which you can interpret as metadata for, for models um, are stored there, but the, the models themselves reside elsewhere, most commonly on GitHub. And at the heart of this is the Open Energy Ontology project, which will give the semantics necessary to, um, to produce uh, consistent metadata and, and fact sheets. Um, and so that's, that's, that, that project is finished um, a couple, month or two ago. Uh, uh, the Open Energy Ontology I talked about is an early stage project. It's licensed CC0. Um, uh, there are several German institutes involved. It's anchored in computer science. I think it's important and I think that's a, a, a lesson that is quite notable in Germany is that um, computer scientists are now involved um, deeply in, in these projects. Um, this ontology project, for example, and the, and the data bus project I mentioned earlier for linked open data. It comes with a foundation basic formal ontology, which parents everything and, uh, and then cats cascades down into to things we might recognize like power plants and um, natural gas and so forth. Two publications in the pipeline. The ERA data metadata project is not limited to open data. Uh, it's an also an early stage project. ERA is the European Energy Research Alliance and it is uh, a substantial organization funded by the European Commission with about 250 member institutions. And the metadata uh, research so far has, has been limited to scoping, but it will be informed by the fair data principles and it will be machine passable. And there is one publication under review at present. I want to talk about something that doesn't get so much coverage, but I think the Global South uptake is something we should talk about more. There is a natural technology transfer through using open models and open data that has the opportunity to make a real um, contribution and it sidesteps the need for cumbersome official agreements because net zero is a global imperative. And open models offer advantages, including a ready, ready access to the community. There are some in our community who are already from the Global South, um, from India particularly, and we also have one or two from Nepal. Um, and I just, I pulled out two projects. I don't generally highlight projects, but the onset electrification planning tool has been applied in, 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 in several countries. Um, case studies and, and, um, and scoping studies. And the Energy Data Info, which is part of the World Bank Group, also is providing very useful information uh, running on software developed by the um, United Kingdom-based Open Knowledge Foundation. I, I just wanted to sidestep for a moment, and if anybody there's, who's listening from a different community um, different research domain. Here are my four points for establishing a community such as the open mod. The first one is protect your core knowledge. And I think that's very evident lately with the uh, wrangle with um, Facebook in Australia to show why you should um, retain full control over your infrastructure. 
You need to trust your community. That's absolutely non-negotiable. You need to establish an ethos for the open mod, open source development values and etiquette with the touchstones, but your culture may different, differ. And there are no shortcuts. If you claim that you are going to form a consensus, then you have to base that on adequate process. And that may be time consuming and lengthy and the case, at times difficult, um, but it's equally necessary. And, um, and, and to do otherwise is, is to short circuit your communities to, 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 to sell it short. I'll skip this one, but this is a, a wish list for public policy analysts and research funders basically related to, to um, intellectual property and research funding. I want to acknowledge, I put this at the end of my talks these days, that shocking state that my generation has left our, left our planet in. The 1990 IPCC first assessment report was entirely clear on the magnitude and urgency, urgency of the climate emergency. And I went down to the first Fridays for Future school strike and I was struck by how young the participants were, really. There's some resources on Wikipedia. I've got some readings if anyone's interested. And I'd like to hand back control to the um, moderator, please. Thanks, Robbie. That's been uh, super interesting. Um, as I say, if anyone has any questions, uh, do uh, it's the time to pop them in the chat. Um, just now. Um, so yeah, um, I guess as a first thing, perhaps I might, as, while we're waiting for people to um, pop their questions in, I'm, you sort of mentioned at the beginning about why you thought the UK hasn't been so involved in this historically. I was curious to, to hear your hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's actually quite difficult for me to identify. I I added reasons as to why I thought Germany had, had taken the lead. And I'm kind of guessing that the inverts uh, for most of those applies to the United Kingdom, but I, that's presumptuous as well. Um, but I guess one thing I have noticed a little in the UK is the idea that um, data is considered to be proprietary. Um, and you even have um, the uh, Royal Mail now private um, claiming ownership of postcodes um, and preventing the Open Data Institute from using postcard da data in their databases. So if that continues, I, I think that, that, that that's, a, that's a dead end street. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that about postcodes. I assumed that they were, I don't know where they came from, but I just assumed. Um, got a question here from uh, Joe Scott. Uh, if we are generally interested, where is the place to go? There are so many projects I've never heard from and the ones I had heard of were not there. Okay. Um, the, the, I would say the Wiki, Wikipedia is quite good. I, I contributed quite a lot to um, writing them up, but there are now so many open models that it's, it's, it's difficult to keep up. I'll I just make a comment on models. There was a discussion within the community, the open mod community, about whether there were too many uh, Python models that were quite similar. Um, I won't mention names, but they embedded AC Parflow and, uh, you know, that was their, their, their kind of starting point and then they bridged out into uh, sector coupling and gas and, and so forth. And there was going to be a, a rewrite in Julia, a community rewrite. Uh, but that didn't take place. And, and people have been arguing that the diversity of models is actually quite healthy. So I guess that's as much as I need to say on that. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask a question in person, as I say, you can, you can raise a hand as well. So we've got a question here from uh, Miriam Neymar. Uh, I noticed Open Energy mentioned on your slides. Is that the same as the newly UK based funded Icebreaker One Open Energy project? No, the problem with the open energy is that it's, it's really heavily overloaded. Um, so the open energy family platform and so forth uh, essentially comes out of a research institute in, in Berlin called the uh, Rhein and Lamona Institute. And it is different from the Icebreaker One open energy project. I, 
I participated in the phase two for the open energy um, project from Icebreaker One, and I am, I, I am a very, very significant fan of that. But I, I will say that, that was, that's a brokered system where um, uh, Gavin Starks talks about preemptive licensing um, so that you don't have to get into negotiations each time you want to uh, access data. Um, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about um, open data that is unencumbered. Yeah, okay, I've got a question here about the um, a recent um, project in the UK whereby the network operators, gas and electricity, have teamed up with um, Ordnance Survey and are now developing a, a platform to, to, to supply this information. I would have put it on the table, but I couldn't get information about whether the, what the licensing terms were. And I think one of the things that I tried to stress was that the open energy modeling initiative started with open licensing from the very outset, and that's a touchstone. Um, and so we, are, we and I, I use the, 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 the royal we, if you like, um, are always very interested in, in, in sorting the licensing issues out from the, from the get go. Ooh, we got a, a comment here from uh, Bunmi. So apologies for my pronunciation. Um, if, if, if you like, we'd be happy to have a, a quick comment from you. He's, he's mentioned about the um, Energy Data Task Force and, and within that presumed open energy data recommendation from the UK DNAs. I don't know if, um, again, apologies for pronunciation, Bunmi, if you have, if you want to say anything there or. Um, uh, no, I think I've put all I wanted to say on it. Um, by the way, pronunciation is 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 good. Um, I've had worse, so that's that's fine. Um, it was just a note to share with the other attendees that um, my colleagues at the Energy Systems Catapult have been doing quite a lot of work on um, you know making data more open and getting DNOs, uh, UK DNOs, to adopt that um, uh, sort of I suppose strategy or, or um, approach. So. Yeah, it was just a note on that, but I'm happy to pick that up with Robbie if that's of interest and I can connect you to the relevant people within the ESC. Uh, I've been more than happy. The, the, the open mod itself has had quite a long discussion with the NSOE um, in relation to their transparency platform on these issues, and they're still not resolved, um, but we're making progress. Um, I, I, my personal view, and I'm not a lawyer, is that the um, database protection does not apply to the transparency platform for some technical reasons, but we don't know that and we want licenses um, to, to, to give us the certainty that we need. Cool. Um, as, as chair, I might take the opportunity to ask another quick question. So it was interesting, you sort of mentioned this idea of um, a social data being a social glue. I hadn't I hadn't come across that before. Um, do you think that's particularly the case within energy, or do you think that's more generally across all of sort of computing that that, or, or is it particularly for for data even more so than other places? I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting question, and it taps into the open science discussion. There, there are there are domains that are more ahead, further ahead than than the energy system analysts, um, particularly around genomics and, uh, and possibly even the coronavirus response. But what I will say there is that we rely on what the European Commission calls um, privately held data of public interest. So we have to go a long way to get the kind of data that we need. And that's one of the reasons I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a it brings the community together because that, that that's a hard that's hard work and um, uh, and it needs agreement and it needs multiple views. Um, yeah, so that's that's that that's 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 where we stand, I guess. Fair enough. Um, so another question for Miriam: uh, Do you think energy companies would provide data without a regulatory push? Oh, they do already. Um, 
in actual fact, um, it depends a little where they are. The, the, the poster boy for us, if you like, is the French network, transmission network operator, RTE, who puts a lot of stuff up on their portal with a, um, with a somewhat archaic French license, which is inbound compatible with the CC by 4.0, which just gets it to where we want. So no, I, 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 I mean, I, I just, I just preface that by saying that, um, that uh, the personal uh, data is, is, a, is a separate issue and the, the things that are the, the, the data that's somehow covered by privacy issues and will go lead into smart systems is more difficult. Another, another question from me, um, and if, there's, if we're waiting for any more. Um, well, recently there's been sort of uh, talks about data markets. I don't know if you've come across any of this, uh, where the idea is you're a wind farm producer. I guess it's kind of related to this idea of data being proprietary perhaps, but you're like a wind farm producer and you're, you've got data about what your wind farms are doing that's sort of much more detailed than what generally gets um, represented. And the idea is to, monetize that so that you can sort of trade it with people and you have to be very careful that you, you don't that there's a mechanism to make sure the data doesn't go out and these sorts of things um i don't know if, if you've come across any of those projects and if you think that any of them would have any value or do you think that they're sort of um likely to be counterproductive or just if you have any thoughts, I guess. Well, I, I have. I mean, that, that's another model. That, that, that data is not protected under intellectual property rights. It's, it's protected under non-disclosure. And um, yes, the, the project I've come across most strongly is um, I participate in the Linux Foundation LF Energy um, Data Architecture Group. And um, uh, Shell Oil, Shell, the, um, the oil major, and, and, and uh, Schlumberger, a, a, a well logging um, company, have, have um, set up a project which they're going to release in about four weeks' time. They have some things on the, on, on the web already, so I can talk about it, called the Open Subsurface Data Universe. And it's exactly the model that you talk about. Um, the, the data there is all tagged with its, um, its legal constraints, and I presume that includes price, I didn't hear. Um, and, that, uh, and, then, and then the, um, the, the people, the 130 companies or so who are involved in that particular universe can then um, transact that um, data much more easily than they would have in the past. I just to add that some of that data is actually public, strictly public domain, because some uh, some jurisdictions, New Zealand included, um, but not Germany, require that if you go exploring for hydrocarbons and you're unsuccessful, then after a short embargo period, that 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 your 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 well logs and stuff are released into the public domain for um, for public good reasons. Public good, if you think looking for natural gas is a public Good, but you know. <laughs> cool. So we got a uh, uh, Kern has raised his hand. Um, I don't know if Kern, you can unmute. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for a great uh, talk. Um, my question is uh, so in the in energy systems modeling, there seem to be quite a few different communities, kind of geographically separated. Uh, like you have energy systems modeling communities in Europe and in the US and other places and they don't always cooperate so much how do you see this developing in the future and what's the what can be the role of open data uh, there yeah I, I think open is the key it's, it's open right through it's open source and um, and open data and and sharing scenarios and doing cross-model comparisons. I think this is just a just an evolution. I mean, in, in the beginning there was um, there was really nothing, and then you had some, I guess, innovators, uh, Tamoa in the in the United States, put an open license on two thousand and eight, for example. Um, Osmosis also up there in the beginning. Um, and they've gone from strength to strength. So uh, the, the idea is not really so much to um, be colonial about this, in a sense, 
but 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 for people to come because they, they, it's advantageous and um, uh, uh, sometimes there are tensions and sometimes there are natural um, affinities but uh, data is something that I think is nat a natural affinity to cooperate around um, my comments about the UK if anyone wants to um, from the United Kingdom wants to chip in on why what why why we haven't seen them we, we held one of our earlier um, workshops in 2015 in Imperial College London but that was mostly due to connections back to Germany um, so yeah please feel free to to speculate. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great. Uh, so we've got a, a question here from Chris Mullen. Uh, since there might be some effort or cost to collating data, do you have any comment on companies sharing data free of charge? Yeah, um, sure. Curation is a big cost. And, you know, I talked about the OP OPSD project. I, I, I guess they had, you know, six or seven figures of funding um, from the German um, uh, economics ministry. So, um, yeah, the, the, there should be public money in here. Um, I, my, 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 my take on this one is that um, if you bring your data to the to the table and share it, then, then you will benefit as well. Um, that this is a collaborative exercise. Um, if you don't wish to do that, then 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 you are free to, to participate, but but maybe it's not so useful for you. Cool. Now a question from uh, Alex Howard. Uh, hi, Robbie. On the topic of personal data. To what extent do you see a need to share more granular energy consumption or generation data? And do you see anonymization or ag aggregation as suitable solutions to pri privacy requirements? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. If you, if you look on the um, OpenMod forum at the moment, there's a, there's a questionnaire from Ithaca that covers, um, that does my summary really of the, of the um, our landscape, our, our, our community data landscape. And yes, uh, if you can anonymize it, if you can uh, statistically estimate it and sample from it, if you can generate it synthetically, sure, fine. I mean, we just need to avoid the, the, the GDPR in, um, in, in the European terms, at least. Cool. Okay. Um, I can't see any more questions. I might just as Chair ask one final question. When, when, when do you think uh, the next conference might be, I guess? I don't know if you've, if, if you've uh, started thinking about that. I don't know, in the UK, they've started, they've put this roadmap out, which claims that hopefully in a couple of months, things might start be to be opening up again. Yeah, OK. Uh, we haven't had any discussion. Um, shortly after the coronavirus hit, we ran three mini workshops, and they were quite successful. Um, and the last one in Berlin, um, just over a year ago was had 190 participants that was physical if anyone wants to stick their hand up on the mailing list and propose something i'm sure people will be very interested that's as much as i can say super okay well um before we close just two and say thanks to robbie um just two quick notices so firstly on this topic of um private data actually quite complementary to some I think it's complementary to this talk um, the uh, I've just put a link into the chat there's an actually a talk with Supergen Energy Networks hub that helped um, organize this they've got a webinar with Faye Tang at Imperial College London London on consumer centric privacy protection scheme for energy consumption data um, so go along there and I guess they'll have some more ideas about how that that could work and um, going forward and secondly, in two weeks, we've got uh, Olivia Carpenter Lomax from Ricardo Energy talking on a completely different topic, uh, decarbonisation of shipping and heat. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thanks to Robbie. It's been a super interesting talk. and We've had really good discussions there. And um, yeah, I hope to, hope to see you all soon. Can I, can I just add, um, thank you. From my side, thanks for everybody who contributed the ideas, particularly in the um, inventory of of data related projects I assemble. Thanks very much. Okay, see you all soon. Thank you. Bye bye.
Thanks. Bye.